What's been interesting with this one is it has become quite a controversial topic. The U.S. needs to continue moving away from a car centric mobility type system. The nature of sometimes the system doesn't work as well as you would intend. Welcome back to another episode of the Fifth Wall Climate Tech Podcast. We are excited today to dive into a a unique topic. The Utah Department of Transportation, or UDOT, announced their preferred solution in August of this year. They want taxpayers to spend around $550 million to install what would be the world's longest gondola system. Also, a 2,500 parking spot structure at somewhere at the base of the canyon near a property called Lakai or a restaurant called Lakai. Make sure you watch all the way through the end to hear the opinions of both of our guests and where we stand ultimately on the gondola. With us today, along with uh, Cedric and myself, Rob Carroll. You want to jump in and give us just a quick background? Yeah, sure thing. This is going to be a controversial topic, I think, any way we slice it. I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, so I use those ski resorts. You know, I I sit in traffic sometimes to get up to those ski resorts. I work on aerospace and defense policy. I also sit on the board of an advanced air mobility company, which is a carbon-free mobility solution, which, you know, in the future may play a role here too. How bad is this problem? Like I've sat in Tahoe traffic for, you know, 12 to 15 hours, which should be a three-hour car ride from SF. Yeah. What is being solved? Well, I mean, it's not a problem unique to Utah. So you pointed out Lake Tahoe. Uh, Denver also faces this problem getting down to the ski resorts. The problem is bad in Utah, but I wouldn't say it's disastrous. I I don't think it's to a point where there needs to be drastic action. But I do think the problem will only get worse, I imagine, with uh, population growth in Utah and those ski resorts uh, being so beloved. I can't say, though, that I found the problem to be as terrible as 12 hour traffic getting to to Tahoe. So I have a unique perspective in this that I grew up in the East Bay. So I grew up going to Tahoe to ski. My family now lives in Utah. So I ski a lot in Utah. I probably ski more in Utah now than I do in Tahoe. It's just better snow. No offense, Cedric. (laughs) bigger mountains and then my mom is from colorado so when we visit family out there we constantly go skiing in colorado too so i've experienced the traffic in all three of these states where utah gets particularly bad is that the promise of utah was always that you could land in the airport and make it up to the ski resorts within like half an hour 45 minutes and that's why the salt lake area utah county are such attractive places to live now for people because the mountains are literally in your backyard you're supposed to be able to not even have to make any plans just wake up morning of and be like oh yeah i'm gonna go get some turns in now though it is getting obnoxious it's hard they call it the the red snake referring to all the red taillights of cars that go all the way up the canyon and just to uh kind of look at both sides of the table so i guess you know, pro pro gondola would be solves traffic problems, right? Solves congestion. It would be fully electric. And so theoretically, it should take some emissions out of the valley, kind of stimulate economic growth for both resorts, Ulta and Snowbird. What are the cons do you, in your mind, Christian or Rob? If I were going to sum up the biggest con, it's that a lot of Utahns don't want it. You can try to make as compelling of an argument, carbon emissions, traffic, but if they, if, if they don't want it, then it's, it's going to be hard in the legislature, if I'm not mistaken, will ultimately make this decision. My general disposition is I'm, I'm excited about big, ambitious projects that are good for communities and good for climate. That being said, like you have to deal with the realities on the ground, which is, you know, do people want this or not? And, and, and are they going to have to pay for it? And if they're going to have to pay for it, through tax dollars, then, you know, that's the biggest con. Kind of double clicking on what you said about, you know, the local Utahns not wanting it and them having to pay for it through tax dollars. Is this, you know, a, a money-making scheme to make the rich get richer just because, you know, it is going to to Snowbird and Ulta, you know, to relatively affluent, you know, resorts? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I feel like a government can push something through like this if it is relatively uncontroversial. What's been interesting with this one is it has become quite a controversial topic covered in all the Utah outlets. And then Vice News, Patagonia came out on one side of the issue. And so you're getting everyday Utahns like myself really worked up about this issue. It's now become a public debate. You know, both sides feel pretty strongly about one way or the other. 
Yeah. And then one other question for you on this side too, or actually on, on just on your background in general, like you do a lot in the future of mobility. Previously, the United States was built around the car, right? There's a lot of lobbying around that. A lot of, you know, oil companies and car companies that were pushing to, you know, design the city, all cities around highways. But does the gondola make sense in the realm of like the future of mobility? If, if Salt Lake moves to, you know, better public transportation, more bus routes, we can figure out this parking structure, other trains that may get you to the base of the gondola, things like that. Does this become more and more attractive with wh- maybe where mobility goes in the future? Or is that just way too far off? And this is just something that's going to be way too expensive. Well, what this conversation brings to mind is if if you visit Zurich, Switzerland, you can get on public transportation in the city center, holding your your skis and your boots, and you can make it to the top of the ski resort within a relatively short amount of time. The term we hear a lot is uh, multimodality. If there's a base camp, gondola, embarking center, right, the place where you're getting on to go up to the mountains, you want to be able to get there by some of those modes of transportation that you mentioned. So by bus, Uh, can you get there uh, with a private car? Can you get there by bicycle? Can you get there by the Utah track system, which which is our our light rail system? If you can do that, and it can be this this multimodal hub, and if you can also get there by, in the future, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, you know, if you can do all that in one place, then I think it's a really compelling thing. Right now, what what's proposed for this uh, little Cottonwood Canyon gondola is is one or two of those modes, which is you can drive a car, which I think is going to be the primary use case, and you can park it. And I think there's 1,500 parking spots that have been proposed for this. Or you can take public transit, right, which are still fossil fuel burning buses. Is this pushing us toward where we go in the future? And I think it's compelling, but it isn't right now. And I think that's why you get a lot of Utahns who are who are like, why, why are we spending all this money on something that isn't that much better. If UDOT wants to sell it better, they have to say, no, that this is where we're headed. It's not just solving the problem that we have now, but it's it's looking 20 years out into the future of what we really want to have. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And but would add that UDOT is notorious for not thinking very far into the future <laughs> with a lot of their <laughs> projects. <laughs> But Rob, we know it's late. We know you jumped on here in some vacation time of yours over in (laughs) London. Uh, We really appreciate you taking the time to jump on with us to discuss this topic today. Uh, Good to see you guys. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Have a pint for us. (laughs) I will. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Christian. See ya. ya. All right. We've got our next guest on here with us today. Someone highly qualified given a civil engineering background, but also someone who absolutely shreds on the skis. Yeah, I'd say I am. Yeah, I grew up in Utah. Uh, I've been skiing the Wasatch, bounced around to all the different resorts. Remember back in high school, powder day, you could ditch class, go right up to the mountain, ski for about three hours and get back to your next afternoon classes. And I feel like that's not a thing anymore. Uh, Most people spend two or three hours potentially in traffic going up, down, I've spent two hours trying to go up to the canyons, made it not even to the mouth of the canyon and said, I'm going home. I'd rather sleep because I got up at 6 a.m., hit the road at 7 a.m. And that's just not even not good enough these days. Based on our shared experience of, you know, growing up, going ski at Utah, we both agree that there needs to be some sort of solution here, like some sort of infrastructure or addition that needs to be made. Are you pro or con the gondola? Given your background, you're you're working on infrastructure and then we'll work from there. I was against it at first, thought that there would maybe be other alternatives that were better, but everything that is going on and what options there are i think the gondola is truly the best solution that is the most reliable most sustainable let's just say every alternative has its pros and cons there's there's no alternative that is true just absolutely magnificent doesn't have any impacts there's always going to be some sort of an impact negatively to someone or something when I first learned about this issue, it, it 
my gut reaction was, wow, that's pretty cool, but it seems a bit of a an over-engineered solution. It just feels like there could be maybe like a phased, you know, approach into like lower cost, more affordable solutions. A- any thoughts on that? The thing is, I th- the public may not understand that it is a phased approach. They're not going to say, gondola is the preferred solution. Let's start building it tomorrow. And I think they targeted the year 2050. How do we address amount of public and users that are going to use the canyon in the year 2050? And so there is, I think, three phases. And I might get this wrong, but the first phase is about improving the bus services up the canyon. I think this year I read that, so UTA back in September, they were planning on buses every 15 minutes. They didn't have drivers. They cut one route completely and the two other routes, they had to go to every 30 minutes. That right there is one of the reasons why a bus solution is not a long-term reliable solution. There are things out of the control. If there's no drivers, how do you, what do you do with the extra, extra buses? Down the road, I think phase three, and this is even predates installing a gondola, is even a snow sh- snow sheds so that we are protected from avalanches. You can open the roads in this year for anyone who lives in Utah or skis Salt Lake, Little Cottonwood. They know it was a very interesting season. You can't eliminate that completely. And so the snow sheds, they improve how many how many days and how much maintenance actually goes into maintaining the roads to keep them open. So going off of that uh, tiered approach, what about, you know, with going through those tiers, how long is it going to take for us to see maybe a potential solution to this, whether that's, you know, road widening and bus system? Um, Obviously, I think those would be maybe a little bit shorter. Maybe the road widening widening takes just as long, but um, to actually get to a gondola, like that size of a project, how long are we looking for that to take? That is a very hard question to answer. Funding is a big, big piece to it. Number two, as they do start doing these solutions, will one of them be the, I guess, temporary remedy that helps alleviate the issue? If we build transit centers and we do enhanced buses without roadway widening of the Little Cottonwood Canyon, maybe that solution that helps and that buys us another five years without a gondola or roadway widening of Little Cotton Canyon. One of the things that's hard is even if we increase the buses, the buses are in the same lanes and same locations, all the vehicles are. So you can't get around snowy, terrible roads and slow driving, uh, accidents that happen that shut down the canyon or stop lanes, buses filling up. It's just uh, the nature of sometimes the system doesn't work as well as you would intend. A gondola car is not going to slow down because of an accident ahead. It's not going to get slowed down because it's snowing. Yes, it might be a little windy, but if you look at the gondola concepts, they evaluate how much wind each gondola design can handle. And so even with a pretty significant wind, they will be able to run certain levels of gondolas. So... Steven, um, really appreciate the time. I think uh, we are right at the top of the hour. So uh, don't want to hold you from any spring skiing. So really appreciate the time and and having you on. Yeah, next time we see you, you'll be super tan. Probably. (laughs) From all the spring skiing, or at least from from here down, you'll be really tan. (laughs) Yeah. Steven, again, really appreciate time. Uh, Thanks for jumping on with us today. Thank you. So we just wrapped up a really interesting conversation. We had Rob a little bit bearish on the the gondola, but you know, at least open-minded to it. Then we were able to talk to Steven, a civil engineer in the state of Utah. Pretty interesting that he flipped. He originally didn't want something like this in the canyon and now does. So Cedric, where are you at? You pro or you con? I would say I'm a bit bearish. And again, I caveat that with a note that I am a 100% outsider looking in. And so, you know, I don't know all of the intricacies and subtleties of, of the inner workings and being a local at Utah. But to me, it still just feels like an over-engineered solution that 
may have repercussions that we don't expect. You know, maybe with the gondola, we're call it 2xing or 3xing the capacity of the mountain, right? Does that then have knock on effects to the quality of the skiing, the resorts, and then also just the environmental damage too, right? Of triple the amount of people using the mountain. To me, it also kind of really underscores the um, the need for equitable development, like using taxpayer money. And it seems like there's just going to be a ton of incremental business and people going to these two resorts, uh, which I believe are private. And so um, just making sure that you know the right people are getting the right benefits for who's paying. But again, you know, if it takes, you know, emissions out of out of the valley, if it helps with traffic congestion, you know, the argument could be made. But I think right now I am a little bearish. I'm going to take the opposite side. I am pro gondola. And this is why. So after conversations, I think that the U.S. needs to continue moving away from a car centric mobility type system. I believe in the future, as a lot of mobility changes and we want to have multiple options, that the gondola could be one of those options. And I think that the payback, um, given the amount of tourism that this generates, really, really makes sense and pencils out. Skiing is only going to keep getting more popular. And so people are just going to keep trying to get up these mountains. It's going to get more and more obnoxious. And the, the one thing that we should hit on is the environmental angle. We've kind of mentioned it this uh, system could actually, at peak capacity, reduce the amount of cars by 1,800 cars per hour. So imagine taking out that many cars off the road that day, like up the canyon. Then you have all the like rubber particles from the tires, the salt that is sprayed. Like you're, you're still going to get that some of that and you have to maintain the road, but you could really reduce that. And all that kind of washes off in the creek that runs right next to the road. And then it says that the emissions, I think, you know, whatever powers it, if this is diesel generators, that would be bad. But if it's uh, powered through the right sources, I think the emissions is actually supposed to be 50% less than allowing cars up. You also take people off the roads and the SR210 or Little Cottonwood Canyon is um, one of the most avalanche prone roads uh, in the world, I think. So that's where I stand. But um, things like this take a long time. There's a lot that's uh, going to have to happen to make this uh, actually come to pass. So TBD on the Utah gondola. But I don't think Cedric will be able to ski out anytime soon. Cool. Well, so those are our hot takes. If you have any thoughts, comments, drop them down below and we will see you next week.